Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Lisa Quigley, the co-founder and co-host of Ladies of the Fright podcast. I'm also a horror writer, and today I'm here with... I'm Rob Olson, formerly of uh, the Booked podcast, and now currently with my podcast is The Arc Party. This is a little bit of a special episode of This Is Horror, as you can already tell from our non-British voices, um, (laughs) where it's the 500th episode of This Is Horror, a huge, incredible event. Um, and Michael has invited us on to kind of flip the script and, and, and interview them for a change. Yeah, and I'm so honored Michael invited us. And speaking of, we should introduce our guests, which are Michael David Wilson and Bob Pastorella. You guys get to be in the hot seat today. How are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Thank you. This is going to be a surreal experience and of course i've spoken with you both on podcasts before but it was your podcast so i i know that we've had crossovers but it hasn't been to the extent that you're going to be (laughs) the ones leading the conversation and interviewing us so i'm excited to do this and 500 episodes one decade of this is horror podcast feeling pretty good yeah, it's it's pretty exciting. I mean, it's you know, a decade of a podcast. You don't you don't really see that too much. And uh to be involved with this, I'm I'm just very very grateful and I'm 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 glad that we have these two hosts today to to host us as guests. This is going to be very very fun. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Bob. I can't think of many podcasts that go a decade. However, if I were to recall one, it would be booked podcast, which, of course, is what <laughs> Rob was formerly the host of, now of the Ark mm-hmm. Party. And, yeah, the, the reason that we chose you to host these this episode, I said these episodes, don't worry, it's like we haven't now <laughs> roped you into multiple. It's like, what, what the hell? Wait a second, what is this? <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah, you, you're two of the best interviewers, the best podcasters. I think Ladies of the Fright and Booked Podcast, when I look back, uh, you know, who, who are the standout horror fiction and writers podcast of the last decade, it's Booked and Ladies of the Fright. So I, I guess no pressure mm-hmm. there from <laughs> opening the conversation <laughs> yeah. with that. Well, on that note, wasn't booked a big inspiration for you when you were starting this podcast? Yes. Was that yeah. like a, yeah, you wanted to kind of do the same thing. Not the same thing, but like you wanted a version of that for horror. Was that what it was? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I was starting the This Is Horror podcast, the three big inspirations were booked podcast, horror, etc., and the Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And I I really admired all three podcasts, but there was something that wasn't quite there. And I could see, like, this is the gap to fill. There's this Venn diagram. So I wanted you know, the, the conversations and the kind of book coverage of booked. And I mean, my, my favorite booked episodes were always the interviews as well. I wanted more of that yeah that was like a little a little treat that would turn up periodically and of course geeks guide to the galaxy they you know were interviewing people every week still are in fact i believe but that was more sci-fi fantasy and horror and honestly like a lot of things that market (laughs) as sci-fi fantasy and horror the horror is normally a small percentage Mm -hmm. and then horror etc it it was a horror podcast. You'd be disappointed with that name if it was more etc. It was more horror than it was etc. But that was more for movies and cinema. So I thought there's there's a gap in in the market here, you know, for a for a horror fiction podcast. And like when I started this is horror the website, and like when I started the this is horror chat book line that later became you know, publishing novellas as well. If I see something that I want to have in the world, 
um, particularly you know surrounding fiction and, and and literary ventures. If no one's doing it, then I create it. Similarly, that is also why I kind of took the. I, I guess I took the foot off the gas a little bit with the This Is Horror Publishing, and by took the foot off the gas a little bit, I mean I haven't published no. anything <laughs> apart from my my own <laughs> things with good old Bob Pastorella there watching. You can buy it today, also an audio book <laughs> narrated by R.J. Bailey. But the reason that I stopped doing <laughs> that This Is Horror Publishing was there, there were so many great, publishers doing novellas and doing kind of sh short uh, versions uh, of books which is also <laughs> novellas look I haven't had that much coffee going into this but great question anyway <laughs> let's move, let's move <laughs> along to the next to the next bit well what do you think Bob thinking oh sorry Bob well, I mean, when I was listening to Booked and I, I didn't know about This Is Hard. Sorry. <laughs> I just, I didn't know. And, and when and Rob, I think Rob and Livius were the ones that told me about This Is Hard. And, uh, and that's when I started listening to it. And I was like, wow, man, it's like this is just strictly dedicated to horror. And I liked it that you cast a wide net. Uh, and you know, because horror is, is, is vast, it's, it's a broad, you know, subject, broad genre. And so it's not just extreme horror or splatter punk. It, you know, it covers Gothic, it covers weird, um, you know, mystery crime, anything really kind of dark fiction, uh, you know, what they call, you know, horror adjacent quote unquote. Um, and it was, I started listening to, to the podcast then, um, uh, but and it's you know booked was really like the first podcast that I ever listened to. Um, I think that you know we had uh, a couple of uh, episodes with the Velvet that I were on, but they they weren't very consistent in releasing the episodes. Um, I think that there was maybe like five or six, um, and then they're probably gone, <laughs> you know, into the ether. So. There, um, you know, and it's, it's, I, on Facebook, I seen what is booked and I was like, what is this? You know? And it's like, oh, it's, a, it's one of those, it's one of those cast things, you know? So it's like, we started listening to it and that's how I became, you know, that I found out about this is horror and I started listening to them and to, you know, to, to realize that now I'm like, you know, a, a co-host of this is horror. That's, you know, to me, it's just, it, it's just I don't know. Some things are always kind of fascinating and that's mm. one of them right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it, we should point out too that whilst I can't categorically say there would be no, this is horror without booked because I, I don't know what other mad ideas I might have had or what might have inspired me. But there would definitely be no This Is Horror with Bob Pastorella without Booked. Because the way that I got to know you was through the Booked anthology. So mm -hmm. we read that. We decided that we would review it. And like back in the day, we did have a review component. And it was a little bit brutal because we would sometimes invite the person on <laughs> while we're live reviewing it. And also, we had John Costello as a host only for about the yep. first 12 episodes. And John Costello, <laughs> I don't know exactly what to say about that dude, but he, he doesn't mess about. He, he will. He did not know how to pull punches. No, no. Like, um, yeah. and it may have been for the best for all concerned that John <laughs> no longer maybe not, Maybe not super. Maybe not super tactful when it came to, you know, bringing. I mean, he's doing he's a just live a, review. <laughs> he's just an honest, direct dude, and I'm just still very, friends yeah. with him to this day. But like, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I decided to move away from reviews too because 
I, I, I just felt like I wanted to throw more positive energy <laughs> into the world and to talk yeah. about the things that I really enjoy and not perhaps like trip people up in terms of this is the kind of stuff that I <laughs> that didn't really work for me. And also, I think I've become more nuanced, probably more empathetic too, and just realizing that like, look, just because a book wasn't for me, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have value, that it isn't for somebody else. And, <laughs> you, you know, John's a straight talker, a literary critic, a, you know, scholar of fiction, and he would just tear apart anything that was that was just not correct, that was not doing it on a certain level. And I just, that's not really what we're about that's not what this is horror is about it's like mm. inadvertently almost <laughs> like a like a, are you taking the 500th episode to to slag off john no i like john like <laughs> john is a more discerning reader and a more discerning critic than i am john is someone that i looked up to for a for a long time he's a dear friend but to have invited Rob and Livia on and be like, we're going to review your book now. <laughs> and like, <laughs> we did the same to Joseph De Lacey. And there were some stories where John would be like, this one just, it just didn't work for me. And here are the did reasons. Did you have it was Bob this, on? It was that, it was this. Bob was not part of to that. To do a Bob review? Not... But we're, Bob... oh, oh, okay. Oh, oh, no, no. no. So it was To do just... it to review his book? Oh. It was just Rob and Livia of the booked podcast. Um, <laughs> But but at the time, there were two stories that really, really stood out in the booked anthology. I mean, generally, it was a great anthology. We don't need to rehash and review it now and like, trigger <clears throat> Rob, get some past trauma. Well, but it, it, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to think this is like a booked 500th episode. We're talking about it so much. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> but, but the two stories that really stood out, with the opening story by Fred Venturini and then Bob Pastorella's story. And I thought, I need to find out more about this Bob Pastorella dude. <laughs> so I looked him up. He had a, a light little Kindle edition of a, a short story to watch his madness. I read that mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, shit. The dude can really write. <laughs> I better <laughs> better talk to him on This Is Horror podcast and invited him on. You can listen to that episode now. I mean, don't listen to it now. Listen to it <laughs> this one. Mm -hmm. But so that it's really it's really interesting because the This Is Horror podcast literally is documenting my friendship with Bob Pastorella. That is the first time that we spoke together. Then mm -hmm. then D Dan Howarth, who was the co-host at the time when he became a parent, it was harder to podcast as, you know, it it is for everyone um, when they become a parent. And so then Bob came in as a as a co-host and then he really never left. This has been like a, this has been a long temporary co-host gig from something like about episode 50 until 500. Might have to remove that temporary label soon. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like Kirk Hammett and Metallica now just to find out that was just a second banana on a temporary yeah. basis. Yeah. yeah. Dave, yeah. Dave Mustaine's coming back. We just don't know when. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would say, on that note, it's it's interesting, and I sometimes think about the fact that you know th this is horror podcast. It's kind of documenting my life, <laughs> even even though it's pre it's presented as an interview and a conversation show. But I mean, I I have I have been through a lot of things in this these last 10 decades and obviously there's the writing and ten the creativity <laughs> T 10 years <laughs> fucking hell <laughs> and <Slip decades>. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually a vampire you look so young <laughs> I, know. 
I know. In, in, <laughs> this podcast is sucking the life out of everybody. <laughs> That's why you can maintain decades. decades. <laughs> this is, this is why I invite people on. To... <laughs> but in, yeah, it's been documenting my life for the last 10 years. I've been through a lot, both good and bad. I mean, like I, I got engaged, I got married, I had a child, I'm, I then split up from my wife, I'm going through a divorce, there's, you know, been some horrible things like being, not being in contact with my daughter for 18 months, but then I, I got reconnected with her, I'm now seeing her again, um, that's fantastic. And, you know, I'm, I'm seeing the light, things are getting better and better on that front. And it is just strange in a way to think I've got this podcast where you've got these weekly conversations and I share these little bits in terms of how I'm, I'm feeling personally. So in a bizarre situation where somebody wanted like a historical document of Michael David Wilson's <laughs> life, it kind of is this podcast and it's a surreal but a really a really great thing really um and i i sometimes think too you know if if my daughter were to wonder well what what happened what was michael feeling in those 18 months that we were apart then if she were to subject herself to multiple episodes of this is horror or just read the transcripts now it'll be quicker although there are some interesting things because uh, ai is not perfect so <laughs> then you know she could find out a little bit about that um it's just fascinating for me there's no real further question attached to that but luckily as i'm not the one interviewing i don't need to have a question on this occasion <laughs> so something that was mentioned probably like 10 minutes ago because michael michael talks a bit um was uh that's a dig i can do that because we're old friends i can do that <laughs> um and also it's 500 we're celebrating you, you all the love in the world um <laughs> Something that was mentioned that I think is interesting to analyze, maybe, maybe not, is like when your podcast started or when my podcast started, Bob Bob called out like it was the first podcast you listened to. The landscape of podcasting was entirely different back then. So mm -hmm. I I mean, like when I made a podcast, there weren't services that just like did it all in one package it up. We had to figure out like 10 different things to like know how to get the final product where it needs to go so like the landscape of podcast of, of podcasting is like re like vastly changed from what it was <clears throat> when we were trying to just do a thing um and so in my personal experience since i stepped away for a little bit and came back i kind of almost have this like imposter syndrome where i'm like everybody's doing this now and is the thing that i'm doing that i have been doing really valuable and so kicking the question to the two of you um in the way that podcasts are now versus what it was when you were you know getting established and stuff how do you feel like what do you feel like your place is in the overall like podcasting sphere like uh has that changed or is it something that it's so ingrained in you that you don't even really think about that well to begin with as is tradition with me, I'm going to not answer that question for the first few minutes and say that you should not <laughs> have any sort of imposter syndrome or worry because, as I said before, you are one of the most accomplished and best conversationalists and interviewers that I know. Now, we're not going to turn this into a complete... <laughs> Rob Olson celebration. So I'll leave it at I that. I really I've hope you don't. Said, <laughs> I've, I've said enough already, but I don't think, yeah, you should be feeling any doubt or worry. And I mean, like people's stories, pe people can worry like, oh, you know, am I contributing or does it, there's enough good writers or good podcasters 
out there, what am I adding? But what we're always adding is our own unique voice, our own unique story, our own unique spin on things. So there's always room. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, there's always room for other podcasts and other writers because what we bring as individuals is is individually us. You can't replicate that. You can't imitate it. You know, Bob tries to imitate um, British people. He just sounds like a knockoff Michael Caine. That's what will happen. <laughs> so don't do that. But <laughs> if people could see the video, then maybe Bob's disagreeing. <laughs> you know, you do you, Bob, if that's, <laughs> if that's what you want to be about. But in in terms of like where this is horror fits in terms of the the landscape i mean obviously when when we were starting out you know and as anyone we had to establish ourselves and i feel you know from the feedback that we get and the articles that i see that this is horror podcast is seen up there with the best kind of in interview shows talking to horror writers so so that's you know r really great obviously for us to to hear that but i think one one thing where we, you know we, we're near the top now i guess is to never get complacent because there are always really really good podcasts that that show up that deliver amazing content and amazing conversations so if I were to think, oh, you know, this is horror podcast is near the top, we can phone this in. Well, then we disappear. People would stop listening. And I mean, we've, we've seen kind of time and time again, there'd be amazing podcasts. Like, in, I almost like see different kind of periods as to when we had like, oh, that's who we're competing against in inverted commas. I mean, obviously... At the start, it was booked podcast, you know, and, and Geek's Guide to a certain point. Although, I, you know, realistically, Geek's Guide, I think, to begin with, had a much bigger audience than us. So if, if I was like, we were competing with you, then I, who, who the fuck are you again? So, you know, I'm not deluded. Um, and then Lo Lovecraft Easy has been around for a long time too. I'm not. I'm not sure when they started. Um, could have researched that beforehand, but this isn't a Lovecraft Easy <laughs> fan podcast, so I didn't. And you know that then, then like around the time of, of Ladies of the Fright, we also had the the horror show with Brian Keane, and I I think for for a long time it was like a, a free podcast that people were talking about and they were like the conversation for if you wanted to check out you know hor horror fiction writers podcasts and then right now I mean that the the big one as well as this is horror is talking scared and talking scared are doing amazing work too um the, there's also a relatively new podcast i really hope i don't butcher the name i think it's called she wore black and that mm -hmm. looks to be a fantastic podcast too i need i need to listen to it more in fact to comment on that further but you know the, the point is that if we didn't continue <laughs> to always strive to better ourselves then we would get lost so i i guess in a sense we've We've gone from, you know, trying to prove ourselves to being like, okay, now you've proven yourself. You you've got to, you've got to kind of defend your position, <laughs> as it were. You've got to make sure that you keep, you keep towards the top. And I hope that it doesn't sound like terribly arrogant or egotistical, because because I'm also very aware that you know compared to the grand scheme of the podcast sphere with podcasts like Tim Ferriss's podcast and Mark Marin and James Eltidger, the, the audience that this is horror has is, is minute. 
you know, so that kind of keeps you humble as well. And e even within horror, particularly with horror fiction shows like No Sleep, and then you see the rise of old gods of Appalachia, and they now have over 8,000 patrons. It keeps you humble. It keeps you aware of, <laughs> of your position. And, you know, I, I think... I think a problem, probably not just with podcasts, but perhaps with ego in general, is when you get a self-inflated worth of yourself, when you get main character syndrome, when you think that the world is kind of revolving around you. So in in a way, th this is a, a tricky position to 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 be in and to even be having this conversation because we're meant to be celebrating this as horror but I also have to make people aware that it's like look I don't think that I'm that great I I can recognize some <laughs> accomplishments but at the same time I'm aware of my position as just a little speck in the cosmos how about you Bob well, I mean, it, it like, and I feel like exactly like you. It'd be real easy to say, you know, that that based upon what's out there, that you know, we we're, we're at you know the top of the crop. But I believe that if you're going to be there, that you have to have a responsibility, and in other words, you have to be consistent. You always have to be, you know, striving to to improve. There's always room for improvement, uh, and you know, that, that's how, that's how you, that's how you get better. It's like, you can't, you can't be satisfied with, with where you're at. You have to improve. There's some really good podcasts for a while. There, there, there wasn't, uh, the ones that you mentioned talking scared, uh, you know, she wore black. I had the opportunity to, uh, spend some time with, uh, Agatha who runs that podcast at Ghoulish Fest. Um, they're, they're doing incredible work. Um, it was just, it was very refreshing because I had, you know, I was, I had an opportunity to be on a podcast panel with some great podcasters there. And, um, you know, and I, I gave, I gave props out to, you know, to other podcasts because it, it's the more the merrier and the ones that are, that are good and are taking it seriously that had, they're taking a responsibility for it. They're going to, they're going to continue to rise too. So I feel like the more that we have, the merrier it's going to be. It's going to, you know, you're going to have a lot of differentiation between the different styles of podcasting and the different formats and things like that. So I'm all for it. I'm for more. I don't see it as competition. I see it as community. I see it as as the way forward. And as long as you as long as you're taking it seriously and doing a response, you know, and being responsible. I always thought of it as a as a network, not like in the sense of mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm networking, but like network as in say you have a channel and there's all these different shows on it that are all that all and right. people come back to that channel for these different shows. Like <clears throat> it's like more as like, you know, every podcast could only put out so much and um, you know, maybe a podcast does a show a week or every two weeks or you know, every you know, twice a week or something like that. But um people listen to podcasts all the time. It's a really primary way a lot of people get their information. And yeah, so I always thought of it as, you know, the fact that there were more meant that they'd keep coming back to mine and they would, because there would be, you know, they wouldn't get distracted by something else. When my show was um, on a, like it wasn't the week the episode was coming out, then they would have something else to listen to. And then they'd be excited for mine when it came out. They're kind of, and that's how I listen to podcasts. I cycle through them as they come out and, and then the new, and then by the time I get done, I'm like, Ooh, new episode of this one. And you know, um, yeah. So, and I always think like, Oh, I don't have room for any more podcasts. And then I hear another one. I'm like, damn, this is good. <laughs> Got to add it. <laughs> so that's not a question. <laughs> um yeah i was thinking though about the the whole trajectory of this is horror and how you guys really um 
I don't know. Like you started off how you started off and you started off actually as a website, right? Mm. Like before the podcast was there. And then there's just this whole um, trajectory of you start the website, you start the podcast. And I'm just wondering, other than Bob joining as the temporary co-host, um, what do you feel <laughs> have been the biggest ways like, how have you grown or how has the podcast grown? I'm throwing too many questions for Michael because he's going to answer all of them. <laughs> how have you grown? How's the podcast grown? What do, what do you feel like has been, other than also the, the change in the podcast climate itself, like what for you has been the biggest way that you've seen the evolution of the show? Yeah, so, I mean, I've said before, but I think one big standout moment was episode 100 with David Moody and he was very open and transparent about mental health struggles and as soon as he did that that there was like almost like a a switch and I realized that like we can go to these dark places we can talk about yeah you know, these really I guess like unpleasant aspects and these struggles and this trauma and it's something that you know I, I talk to people about in in everyday life <laughs> that's just the way that I am I see I seem to have something <laughs> where people open up to me and will talk about these kind of things and may, maybe you know it's because I'm non-judgmental about everything and I'm just listening and I'm letting people talk but I realize that we can do this on the podcast too and not not only can we do it but actually I think we should do it because in talking about struggles other people listening realize that they're not alone and I think when when that happened that was like a big moment to in my opinion at least really improving not just the quality, but the authenticity and the realness of these conversations. So that that would certainly be a point in, in terms of the evolution of this as horror. I think, too, like I'm always conscious of becoming a better conversationalist and getting better conversations and insights from guests. So I think you know, that there's no specific moment where I realize that that is a constant. I'm always trying to improve in that area. I, I, I think, I think too, like early on, we were perhaps more structured or rigid with questions. And it's like, I've got my list of questions. I'm going to go in, I'm going to ask those. Now, ev every time I'm interviewing somebody I'm very prepared. I have a list of talking points and questions and little bits of trivia from their life. And, you know, sometimes they get a little bit <laughs> worried. Like, how did you know that my mother used to buy me the Guinness Book of Records every Christmas as a present? <laughs> and it's like, danger later, if it's on the internet, I found out. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah I, I think being not being afraid to to go where the conversation takes you so I may have all these notes but sometimes it's just one or two notes <laughs> that we even cover but having having these these backups or these topics so that you know that the conversation will continue to flow because uh, you, you don't want you don't want dead air that is not good that is the death of the podcast and of the audio format maybe that's why we've branched into video too so that you you got something extra you can just look at bob in his lovely blue t-shirt or something like that when when there's a bit of silence um i i i think like a a big moment that I always mention is talking to Chuck Polanik, you know, episode 365. Um, just one of these writers that I always 
admired and had, had been reading for throughout my life and then to get to talk to him that was surreal also surreal was earlier this year when Dean Koontz added us apropos of seemingly nothing on Twitter. You know, a, a few a few days later, we're having a conversation about getting him on the podcast. Like some people ask me, you know, how, how did you get Dean Koontz on the show or... You know, other podcasters asking, how do I go about getting Dean Koontz on the show? And it's like, well, in truth, as as weird as it is, it's like he kind of came to us. I don't know how that even happened. But, you know, that was a fantastic <laughs> moment. And then when we had the conversation with him, I put that up there in the best conversations that we've ever had on This Is Horror. And, you know, fingers crossed, we should be getting him back on the show to talk to him again later this year. I mean, he, he said, like, awesome. yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd love to do this again. And anytime, <laughs> anytime. Okay, Dean, let's go. <laughs> we got the microphones <laughs> plugged in. But, I don't yeah, see him here like, right now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just... Add, add him to the call. <laughs> but, yeah, D Dean Koontz and Chuck Paulinick are, are two very mm -hmm. big moments that's like, I guess people are, are paying interest to to, to what, what it is we're doing here. Um, mm -hmm. Bob, do you want to talk about any moments that you see as the the evolution of this is horror because I'm meandering into another question right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I see if I look at it from my own personal growth, I know when I came on with the, with the podcast, um, one of the things that, that I have found over the years that I have become a better listener. Um, and I, I was probably a lot more chatty at the beginning of, you know, my tenure, uh, that I've shifted that around because I've wanted to become a better listener. Um, you know, and Michael, Michael has his questions and, um, I, I have found that a lot of times our questions would overlap cause I would have questions and, and he would, he would get to them. So I'm like, well, I'm going to ask that same question. So how, how, how did you do that? You know? <laughs> and so I'm not going to do that, but, I found that one of the things I can do is that I can take a topic and I can, I can help expand it. Um, and sometimes Michael doesn't get to his questions, but oh, well, because I have taken, you know, our, our guest and expanded conversations into areas that expanded even further than that. And so it's like, Hey, this turned out to be a great conversation. To me, I think one of the the, the best moments that it, that really comes to mind was when we had Dean Koontz on, and he said that you guys have asked me questions that no one else has ever asked me before. He said and, that multiple times. Yeah. And yes, yeah. and Dean, and here's a guy who's been interviewed, interviewed <laughs> multiple. You can search his name and put the word interview, and you'll get pages. And so, and I, and he seems like the type of person who's not going to hand out a compliment very easily. He's <laughs> genuine and he's very nice, but I don't think, I think he was being very genuine in that. And that, that made me feel really good when we have one of the best in the business say, Hey guys, you're asking me questions. No one's ever asked me before. This is great. And I, I love that. And to me, that's when you're doing you're doing the job. You're doing it right, you know. And that, to me, that's 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 a big highlight. Uh, I missed the Chuck Palnick, uh conversation because I was uh, I didn't have any power. I just come back from a hurricane, and uh, <laughs> like the story of my life, my power comes on with the internet, literally. And you can ask Michael; he can confirm this. Literally five minutes after they ended the conversation. 
Am was I, am I Ida? Wanting... Was that Ida? Was that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think so. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because it was just, you know, it was just like, what, two years ago. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, or maybe and probably, probably about a year and a half ago. So Michael's well, promised me he's, yeah. he's going to get Chuck back on. So I'm holding to that promise. <laughs> Part because two. Chuck is also <laughs> one of my favorite writers, <laughs> you know? So um, can I, I'm going to chime in a little bit about what I think uh, an evolution of the podcast is. And maybe this is just something that I'm thinking about recently, but um, there was definitely a moment where um, Michael, you had kind of switched from, really not talking about the personal stuff you were going through to having a moment where you Mm. really went into it. And um, so it's hard. It's hard to like talk about things like that, that are even hard for you to think about. So the idea of sharing them has to be even more difficult, but um, I feel like from that point going forward, you felt a little different too. You felt a little bit more like you're making eye contact with me when you're talking. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I felt like it was a little bit more intimate or personal than maybe it had been in the past. And to your credit, now when I'm doing my podcast, I feel more comfortable to talk, talking about some of the, the kind of big struggles I've had in the last few years. So um, if I'm talking as, as a listener or a fan of the podcast, I would say that one of the things that would definitely be an evolution point would be when it became comfortable to get a little more personal and be a little bit more, more open and vulnerable. And and in terms of talking about that, are you specifically referencing the Jonathan Jans episode or are you talking before that? The Jonathan Jans. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to that point, I I would say, or at least my perception of myself, which is inherently going to be flawed, that you know, for 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 years before that moment, I had developed you know being honest about struggles and being authentic, and you know when when I became a parent and I had some struggles and I had some health concerns I was very direct and upfront about that and then you know when when I split with my my ex um I you know I I said about I I mentioned that but I didn't go into specific details then when things got very complicated in terms of custody and there were legal proceedings going on legal proceedings that are still going on i was very mindful that i didn't want to talk about them for numerous reasons you know number one don't talk about a legal situation (laughs) that is ongoing you know that that is rule number one but also just like kind of being respectful to to everyone's privacy and to people involved um also plainly like it's not it's not really anyone's concern apart from the people involved (laughs) um but i i i did have this struggle because it's like you know there, there was a point where it's like i i am going through the most pain i have ever gone through in my life this is this is a difficult moment to be very British about it. A difficult moment, you know. <laughs> to to be blunt, like I don't know, I don't know how many people could have gone through some of the things that I did, and then still still be here, still be alive. Mm. I'm, you know, that that if if there were different things in terms of my my wiring and who I am then there could have been a point where it's like, you know what? I'm, I'm checking out. I'm done. Mm. Mm. So, th- th- but there, there was a real struggle in, in terms of being with on the podcast as well. Somebody who, who, who encourages transparency, who prides himself on his authenticity. And you know that there's like a silent scream that I can't get out. Mm. And that was difficult because it also, 
there was also a point of me that felt like, you know, to, to say that I felt fake or, or, or insincere, it's not, that's not quite true. But like, you know, I knew that it's like the, there's something that I'm holding back. <laughs> it's probably when people get caught in a situation and, and they say like, oh, I didn't lie to you. I just didn't quite <laughs> reveal the, 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 the <laughs> truth. And it's like, yeah, but that's not going to get you out of um, a number of situations. <laughs> it's like you didn't ask the direct question. It's like, so if, if people ask me a question, then I will... I will answer it as best as I can. Um, now I wonder what was what was the moment with Jonathan Jans that led me to be that honest. And I gotta I gotta try and take myself back to it. So it, it was about I think we recorded it about September or October of last year. Um, yeah, you know, and and there was relatively little progress, you know, for the past year before. I I think I just got tired of holding it in and exhausted. And like I and like Jonathan Jans is an in, incredibly kind, compassionate, wonderful human being. Mm-hmm. I think he ma- he he makes people feel safe, and it it it, it, it was he does it was impromptu. That was not mm-hmm. planned. It was not like today is the day, but mm-hmm. I, I, I just, I just felt there was a little bit more that I could say, and I'd obviously seen like how things were proceeding, and it, it just felt like if I say this, I'm not impacting the case in a negative way. Right. It's like, what are they gonna do? They're gonna, they're gonna quote me in a legal document saying I miss my daughter. Oh no! Yeah. Oh God! Don't use that against me. Um, <laughs> yeah. But but like, e- even when I talk about things, you know, I'm trying to be respectful to everybody involved. Um, yeah. E- even now, it's like thinking, like, what do I? What don't I say? <laughs> um. It is difficult, as you as you can see. Um, I mean, I, I've I've been through. I continue to go through some things, but then, like, I don't I don't hold myself up on on a pedestal or think you know pe- pe- people. I I don't really want even people to feel like bad for me. It it it, it is what it is, and I mean. I was reading some philosophy the other day, as I am wont to do, as people who read my fiction and probably hear all the quotes at the end of the episodes know that I like to do. Um, and I, it was, I, I think, some sort of uh, Taoist master. He kept having things happen to him and... And and like uh, you know, people would either say, "Oh, that's really good," or "That's really bad." So one of them was his his son broke his leg, and they're like, "Oh, th- this is really bad. I'm so sorry to hear that this has happened." And he said, "Well, you know, it, it's it's neither good nor bad. We don't know." And then a few months later, um, people yep. of his son's age were were called to battle. Well, he couldn't go. So if, if if he hadn't broken his leg, then he would have gone to battle, gone to war, a high probability that he would have lost his life. So I think when these things are happening to us, when anything happens to us, we cannot see the bigger picture. So we do not know whether something is good or bad. And I mean, I I try to be an optimistic person. I try to see the light. And I think that is one of the things that kept me going in those really dark moments. Because even if I couldn't see a light, I believe that there was a light out there. I just can't see exactly where it is, but, but it's there. And I had that hope and I had that belief. 
And I mean, at, at the moment, I could hold on to the fact that I didn't see my daughter for for 18 months. I could dwell on that. I could see that as a really negative thing. Um, or I could concentrate on the fact that as of now, I am seeing her every month and I am having a video call with her every week. And yeah, you know, that there was a time where I was really concentrating on like, you know, I've, I've gone from, from 50, 50, like seeing her half the time, not seeing her the other. And, 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 and I'd gone from that to zero. And I, I could now like see like, oh, well, I see her a small percentage. Let, let's say it's, it's 5%. Paul Tremblay's not here. We're not about quick <laughs> maths right now. So, so, so if, if I'm seeing her 5%, then there's two ways I can look at it. I can say, oh, that's 45% less than I was two years ago and be really negative. Or it's like, five percent is so much better than zero that's what i look at and also you know see, seeing her 50 percent at a time um you know the the parenting can be can be harder but if i'm seeing her five percent at a time here we go. Daddy is here. We are going to have fun. You can make every single moment count. I just realized if someone in the next <laughs> room heard that, it's like, wait, I thought, I thought you were recording a podcast. What kind of dad is here? We're going to have fun. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, I knew he got on with Bob well, but shit. <laughs> I might have to explain that one later. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> the the after the Jonathan Jans episode, after that moment, it get in in sharing what was going on with the This Is Horror audience. It gave me strength to make bolder, more compassionate choices in general and with the legal situation. And then, so this is a point where it's like, I'm not even sure how much I can now say, like, I'm not, I'm, and they, again, there's that battle with authenticity and transparency. And it's like, I, when things are over, I am happy to talk <laughs> at length about these things, but but in, in, in October or so, we aired the episode with Jonathan Jans. We got some very positive, very kind feedback about that vulnerability. And then there was, and then the next month I had a court case. And that there was a switch in, in the, and, and I, I took a chance with something. It's kind of like a movie moment actually in, in the court. And since then things have been better. I saw, I saw my daughter for the first time in, in February. I had a call with her in January for the first time. And so, you know, every single month, I'm seeing her, um, uh, you know, that there was, mm, that, that's, that's all I'll say for now. That's all I'll say for now, but thing, things have got so much better and I think, mean, you know, try, try and see the light in difficult situations that's mm -hmm. yeah that, that's about it this is why i talk so much because 
as a podcaster, <laughs> yeah, you got to feel that silence. So <laughs> even if you're taking well, moments to reflect, it's like, well, we got another MDW tangent. I can take us all on, don't you want? <laughs> well, thank you for, I mean, that's, thank you for sharing what you can and what you're able. And I don't think anyone sees it as you not being authentic. Um, I don't feel that way anyway. Uh, there's certain things you just, especially when you're in a situation like this, it's just not wise, you know? So I don't think, mm. but I also feel like maybe on your part, it might be like, but I want to talk about this. I want, I think something about it is like when you can talk about it, you get to have that, um, that release and that sharing and that it's almost like witnessing people are in it with you. And so I feel like there's that understandable feeling of separation in some way, but, um, but I think we all appreciate that you share what you can as you can. But I'm also curious for Bob, um, what has that been like for you being in this and like being the partner in all this, you know? And also like well, with, that, with that moment with Jonathan Jans and then the trajectory from there. The thing with that was that, you know, I, I knew – a lot of what was going on. Um, and so, and I would, you know, me and Michael would, would confer by email and I, I don't have children. So I, I can't, I can't imagine. I can't imagine what it would be like. Um, I'm not even going to say that I'm in a position that, to where I could even begin to imagine it. But the only thing that I could do was to, to try to give Michael as much support as I possibly could. And I, I hope that he could see that in my email, I was trying to be as, as, you know, as, as supportive as I could. And yeah. And we, we, you know, we had conversations and, you know, talked on Skype and things like that because um, some things uh, can't translate well on, on the page. You know, they have to be in context. They have to be, you know, you have to hear someone's voice. Um, and so in it, it we, you know, me and Michael, we've been, we've been friends for a long time. And even though I can't even relate to that, I can relate to, to terrible things that, that have happened to me. And, and I know that, um, sometimes, you know, it, it's like Michael said, sometimes it's, if you're wired differently, it's easy. It's like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm out. And I'm not going to ever say that I didn't feel like that when I was going through my stuff, but there's a light at the end. You may not see it. It may be a pinprick in that, tu in that tu you know, in a tunnel, but it's going to get brighter and you just have to push through it and you have to, 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 to be, you know, authentic to yourself and believe in yourself and believe that there's a better outcome. Um, when we had Jonathan, Jan Jonathan is so easy to talk to. That's, that's the key. He, he has a very calming effect and he, I, I love it when he's on the podcast because we're going to get, you know, we, it, I feel like we're getting the real him. Not that there's like a fake Jonathan Jans where he's like, Hey, uh, party guy, Jonathan Jans with his pants, you know, but <laughs> nothing like that, but you know, <laughs> so uh, listen to the podcast and know what we're talking about. But anyway, uh, he uh, he's just very he's very authentic and he's very easy to talk to. And I had you know I had no idea that that it was we were going to go there, but it was a moment that I mean we were all choked up. Um, it was it was a very vulnerable moment, but I feel that that lifted a weight off of Michael's shoulders that was, that was, that was pulling him down and the weight's not off his shoulders yet, but it, they've taken, they've taken some weight off the, off the, off the bar. You know what I mean? There's still some weight there, but they took, they took two forty fives off. So now he's down to like these little tens. <laughs> you know, if you're looking at it from a weightlifting thing, they took the forty fives off. The forty fives are off. <laughs> So is that, if that, if, does that make sense, Michael? I mean, do you feel that? Because I can tell, I can tell the difference. I know that it, Rob can, and I think Lisa can too. But we can. Do you feel that? 
Yes. Yes, I do. But I, yeah. I, I think the the thing, the thing that happened post Jans, which sounds like some mm-hmm. sort of weird genre. Oh yeah, <laughs> listen to some post Jans. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, when when I took that risk, and 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 there was a moment that happened. Mm-hmm. After that moment, it literally felt like like there'd been this anxiety there'd been this tension Mm -hmm. every time i got an email from my lawyer up until that moment i was consumed with dread and anxiety and i've definitely never said that on the podcast before um but it wouldn't matter what the email was it could even be like, mm-hmm. oh, confirming you'll be at this meeting at this time. Seeing the name in my inbox just mm-hmm. sent this wave of dread and anxiety. And when this post Jan's moment occurred, <laughs> I didn't feel it anymore. <clears throat> and that right. there was there were certain triggers, there were certain things that would cause this anxiety and and this pain and then it was like it's it's gone it Mm -hmm. and it hasn't came back it hasn't came back um that's good it's miraculous really (laughs) um Mm -hmm. yeah so i i feel it but i'm yeah i am still so reluctant to talk to talk about this too much because i don't want to be i don't want to be disrespectful to anyone i don't want to mm-hmm. inadvert inadvertently be disrespectful to my ex mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that and you know it's like is is even talking about things is 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 that disrespectful and like it it you know it doesn't matter whether whether my ex does that publicly or or not, just for me, it's like, I don't want anyone to hurt. And it it doesn't matter whether I've, I've been, I've hurt or not. Like, I don't even like using the language, like, you know, someone has done something to me or someone has hurt me. It's like, one can feel pain we cannot control what happens externally, but we can control our internal reaction to it. And so even saying like, you know, someone hurt me, it's like, did they? Or did my reaction to the situation cause pain? And of course there Mm -hmm. can be things where it's like, well, yeah, a lot of people are gonna feel pain if that happened or they're gonna think oh that was like a negative thing to occur but what why why did you know intentionality why did a person do a certain thing that is a big factor and i don't believe that many people do things to hurt other people and some people disagree with me on that but that's not what i think I think most of the time, even if people do things that people could be, could perceive as actions that hurt other people, and even if they do hurt other people, they probably didn't do it to hurt the person. They did it to protect themselves or to selfishly benefit themselves in some way. And that it, it may be a a subtle distinction but i think it's a vitally important one and i think that it's one that keeps us human and i think that's why it's kind of dangerous and we're we're going off on another tangent here but to create (laughs) this society where everything is this or that you're on that side or you're on the other side it's good or it's bad that's not reality that's not how humans are so we're nuanced 
there are shades of gray we're a multitude of colors we're a fucking rainbow we're complicated and i don't think tribalism and i don't mm -hmm. think you know saying that that is good that is bad is is going to further us and actually if we talk to people more then we, we're gonna realize we had more in common than we thought we did that's that's a big topic that's big hours topic, of conversation right there but it, it's something that i think about a lot mm -hmm. me too mm -hmm. yeah the, 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 the funny thing as well is when you dare to see when you dare to see the point of view or the perspective from two different schools of thought then you run the risk of ostracizing everyone and everyone fucking hates you because you didn't choose a side or you, you know, it, it, it's a tough one. And, but I, I think it's okay to say, you know, this is the side that I'm on for this issue. So you pick a side, but to say, I can maybe see some points from the other side, or even if I, even if I disagree with it, on on such a level i can see how some decisions or or some of your logic even if i think it's twisted got you to where you are you know today mm -hmm. we're not really talking about my personal situation anymore and i'm not even talking about a specific thing but we are talking about any issue where there is absolute division let let's just you know let let's 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 get every everyone turning off with with episode 500 let's just piss everyone <laughs> off this is you know we we started with john costello we end with the spirit of john costello <laughs> what would john well, do <laughs> so what you just kind of led my mind to and what i think that we've been kind of saying without saying a lot of ways has to do with empathy mm. and I would have to say that um, empathy is something that <clears throat> horror kind of naturally evokes in people. Mm. So um, I know this is just a very rough thought, but like, um, and this isn't me ham fistedly trying to get things back on track. It's legitimately like the thought that was inspired by what you were saying. Um, I think that understanding other perspectives is like very much an empathetic thing. And I think that experiencing horror and think about horror, reading horror, watching horror helps you to kind of analyze. I probably just made a terrible noise because I hit my microphone thing. Um, analyze um, different perspectives. So there's almost like, it's almost like maybe that's a muscle that you've been building by being so immersed in stories that inherently play with empathy. Or it can be yeah, and, yeah. And I, I, I think too, you know, we, we were talking about the evolution of the podcast, but if, if we're to talk about the evolution or, or at least the changes in terms of horror fiction as a whole for, for the last 10 years, I feel that there is, there are more, I'm trying to think how, how to even put this. I Like initially, I was going to say there's been a bigger push for diverse voices within horror, but a bigger push, sound, that doesn't quite sound the phrasing I... that I, that I exactly wanted to put across here, but what... What I'm saying is we there is an environment now where more diverse voices and perspectives are welcomed, and that is mm -hmm. a very, very good thing. And I think mm -hmm. as a result, we are seeing more interesting stories. Because if I think about the kind of 2010s, the biggest thing probably at that time was zombies. <laughs> I think about David Moody and Brian Keane, and you know that that was all great, but like it, it, it felt like a lot of what was popular 
was more kind of traditional tropes and things that you'd easily fit within the horror genre. Whereas now, like, I, I think that, I think that stories that kind of cross over horror with another genre make for more interesting stories. And I mean, I know that we were talking off air, me and Bob via email, and you know, Bob Bob was talking about the stories of of V Castro, and that is a completely unique voice. V is a completely unique voice that you know, I I don't feel that we had you know stories like that to you know t- ten or so years ago, and. Mm-mm. You know, e- even if you see what's going on with Children of Chicago and Cena Paleo, did w- you know would would that have been as as well received? Would that have even been published ten years ago? I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. I had conversations recently with Cassandra Ka and Danielle Trussoni, and this kind of idea came up in both of those and. Especially, especially with Cassandra Ka, their idea was essentially like, because I said something along the lines of like, it's not like suddenly, you know, things changed. It's always been this way. And, and, and their point was marginalized voices have, you know, um, more attention and, you know, more, I guess, opportunity to reach audiences than, than they did in the past. So it's not like a sudden quality change. It's an access change kind of in a way. Yeah. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's kind of like what I've been kicking around in my head lately is um, the playing field is a little bit different. It's not like suddenly there's so many more of this type of voice. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. things changed in, yeah. the, in the industry. Yeah. And that actually makes me think of um, at the beginning, Michael, you were talking about how, you you recognize and like the spirit of this is horror is like kind of recognizing that you have there like you have a taste when you read a book Mm. and um someone else might have a certain taste and you might read a book that you're like i don't really uh get it or it's not really for me but that doesn't mean it's bad and i actually it relates to everything we're talking about i'm gonna bring it back but um i actually really think that when we look at what taste is and what our taste is, our taste is informed by what we've already experienced. And a lot of what we've already experienced is the, is from like the dominant perspective of like who holds the power and what have you. And so I think it's really interesting um, the way that like, as these stories are given that the platform, like, like you said, like, it's not like, they just appeared out of nowhere. These people have been here and writing these stories and there's artwork that's been underground that maybe didn't get as much um, spotlight or platform cap- capacities in the past. And now that these different types of stories are coming, I do kind of almost notice like, uh, how do I want to say this? Like there's a when people do critique things or say like, oh, this isn't, I don't like this, this isn't very good. Like it does feel to me like a lot of the time that taste, it, there, there's not a consideration of how that taste might be informed by what you yep. haven't been exposed to. Do you know what I'm saying? And and do you have thoughts on that? Great point, by uh-huh. the way. That's an excellent point. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree <laughs> with what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And in a rare moment of restraint, I don't think there's much that I need to add to it, you know, because uh, yeah. otherwise I'd just be reiterating exactly what you've just <laughs> said. Mm-hmm. I, well, I mean, I it's like if, if you had, if you just ate peanut butter and jelly your whole life and suddenly you're eating like sp- like Indian food, it's not that the Indian food's bad. It's that your palate's not ready for something like that. Like you haven't, you haven't been exploring like all these flavors or something. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there's this tendency to be like, oh, it's not good. I don't like, and it's like, well, wh- on what level of, on what merit are you, are you 
even mm-hmm. what barometer are you using? And I'm not saying that this just happens with um, with voices that haven't been as much in the spotlight, but even when somebody does something that's, you know, I don't know if you've read the um, Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction by Ursula Legon, um, Ursula K. Legon, and there's a, a or Le Guin. I'm I never can figure out how to say her name, so I'm very sorry, <laughs> um, but she kind of talks about like, it's like a alternative to like the hero's journey and like the, and I, and I'm going to botch it cause it's been a while since I've read it, but how in the carrier bag theory of fiction, you're, you're kind of collecting things as you go. And it's more of a meandering story and it's not necessarily following a specific type of structure. And so I don't know, this just has me thinking about like what happens when we try experimental <laughs> things that maybe don't fit like a certain um, all these different plot points and then this, oh, it's not good. And and then also like that just for me brings us back to where does that, that version of good come from? And not saying that it's not good, but can there be other uh, versions of good? And I think that's something that is really exciting to me about horror right now is that there's so many people doing really just cool things and not feeling limited mm-hmm. by I have to, I have to fit some set type of narrative or whatever. So. Mm-hmm. Right. I think what we're seeing is a lot of people saying that things, and I see this on social media and I think it's, it's more like a social construct. When people say that something's bad, they're simply saying that they didn't like it, but which is fine. Not saying, <laughs> yeah. In other words, like but they have to say it like, cool. It's like, <laughs> Hey, you know, it's like, Oh, I really didn't like it. So I'm going to type in, this was bad. It's like no, you just didn't like it, and that's that's okay. I, I don't I don't like a lot of things either. Yeah. Okay, but you have to be willing to try it, and I think that's what's changed the landscape. It's like you know, there's a push for diversity. No, there's more diverse voices in horror fiction now than there ever has been before. The door has been kicked open, and it's not going to close anytime soon. And this is the kick in the ass that horror needed. It has been going, it has been coming on for the last probably 10, 12, 15 years. Zombie started it, but we've killed the zombie. Sorry, David. Uh, But I mean, you know, and they're still making zombie stuff, but you know, David, David's probably going to try to kill me now, but uh, David Moody, but uh, he's I mean, got a new it's, zombie book coming out. He's he's not threatened. Oh no, he's gonna throw it at me. <laughs> <laughs> Big Bob, no, uh, but uh, we're we're seeing it now, and it, it's this is gonna propel horror for probably the next ten to fifteen years because things are cyclic, and so this is a good thing. We need to ride the wave. The door's been kicked open. It's not going to shut anytime soon, and I'm all here for it. And I think that if more people would simply, if they don't like something, to maybe try something else instead of sticking with the same thing, then we'd have a lot more fans, a lot more people interested in, and that's, that's, you know, to me, it's, that's where it needs to be. Yeah. Talking about the, I I don't like it part of it too. Um, This is really quick. Um, I'll point to Sadie Hartman who doesn't do reviews anymore. She does responses to books. And I think that something that I evolved to, and one of the reasons I moved away from booked was because we were a book review podcast and I got tired of saying, this is what quality that this story is because it really was more kind of a judgment on me than on the book. Like it was saying, this is what I like. This is what I didn't like. So um, I think that, uh, the the move away from evaluating something and the move towards saying like, hey, this type of story would be good for this type of audience, I think also helps to elevate people and their work too. You know, speaking of Sadie, uh, one time, I think it was like as she started to move into the like less of a um, reviewer and more of a responder, she had put out a tweet one time and she was like, I'm not a critic i'm a curator and i just love that like not being and i actually feel that way about this is horror i feel like 
um, that's what I like when you interview the authors, you're talking to them, you're saying you're t learning about their lives, you're going uh, into their stories, you're asking them vulnerable questions, and not just for the sake of being vulnerable, but I feel like there's a real genuine sense that you actually care and you want to, um, you want to know and you want to give them a space to share. But what I've always loved about your show and what inspired me, even in the way I, Mackenzie and I did ladies with a fright was just, um, that it wasn't about like, are you a good writer or not? You know, it was like, are, are you, who are you and what do you care about yes. and what do you write about? And in that sense, you're, you're curating for the listener because there's so many times that I would have seen the books you were talking about on the show and seen them on Instagram or somewhere. And like, was like, I don't know if I'll be into that. And then I listened to your episode with the author and I'm like, I really like that author. I think I'm going to really like their book and I read the book or I get the book. So it's like, you're, it's like that scent. The vibe I get is that you're um, curating for the listener rather than just providing them with a, this is good. This is bad. Like it's curating. You're pre you're giving the author a platform to share about themselves. And then you're in that sense, you're almost curating um, for the listener's taste or for the listeners, um, what the listener will resonate with. Yeah, I think so you, a lot of this is how we're... <laughs> oh, go on. I was just going to say, I just want... I, that was not a question. It was just me saying how awesome you guys are. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> well, thank you. But I, I, I think a lot of this is horror, particularly these days, and again, talking about the evolution, is like we're finding out the story behind the story. Because if people want the story or you can buy the story but we want to you know find out what what's behind that what were the inspirations but it's like we're getting to the core of each individual so actually my favorite conversations with authors are usually the first conversation I have with them because then I can find out like kind of about their life, about these life lessons that I always like to talk about mm -hmm. and, you know, f find out what, what is it that makes them tick? What is it that has shaped them and made them become the person that they are now? So in, in many ways, it's almost like a kind of, this is your life. Um, and, other people sometimes because we'll go to these painful places have said like wow this is like therapy <laughs> you know but that's you know that that's what is kind of interesting but it it's been interesting that even though that that is the kind of mode that we're in now because we're having some repeat conversations with fantastic authors like Max Booth and Eric LaRocca, it means that we're then almost going back to the beginning and deep diving into their books. You know, re recently with, with Jordan Harper's latest book, of course, with Rob for Abnormal Statistics by Max Booth. So it, it's a little bit like we, we've gone full circle, but, <laughs> but now... I mean, the, the way the way that a conversation will often happen, because it's typically two hours and, you know, the, the first half will be, right, this is about you. And then the second half, this is about the specific book. And and that is probably the, the format that kind of strikes that balance. And it's like, if you want to find out about the person and their life lessons, then you listen to part one. If you just want <laughs> to kind of <laughs> dig in to the book, then part two is probably for you. So I don't know, part one is Tim Ferriss and part two is Talking Scared. If you want some comparisons <laughs> of, of other podcasts. Um. <laughs> You, you know, I, I, I think when when I kind of tripped up over the word about like a, a push for diversity, why I didn't like that is like I, I don't want I didn't want people to to feel 
incorrectly and to misconstrue that it's like, oh, you know, now it's like only diverse voices that are being published. And it's like, no, it's like diverse voices is an addition. There's nothing being taken away from the voices that we had before. We're just adding mm. more. And that is an amazing thing. And also, you know, diverse voices are not published solely because they are diverse voices. That is tokenism. That is bullshit. The stories that are published are really good fucking stories. And, you know, that that's the same with, like, you know, what, why we interview who we interview. We interview people where we, we like their books. There's something about the book. There's something about the person. I'm probably articulating this really clumsily, but <laughs> I, I, am I articulating this badly? I think you probably get the, the sense of what I'm trying to say if I'm not saying it quite correctly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think recently for me, um, I have been really reveling in the idea of taking chances on people that I have not talked to before, but also have not heard other people talk to. Um, so I'm really liking the idea of just approaching new voices that are completely new to me um, and just kind of taking a chance on just it kind of expanding my, my reach. And so far it's been fantastic. And um, that like, so to me, I used to feel like the safe thing is to talk to, the people I know and the people I know that we're going to have a good conversation. And now it's more of like, who, who am I doing myself a disservice by not talking to? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Like Lisa, what are your thoughts on this? Oh man. On just the whole topic in general or <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I understand why the word push doesn't, feel right but sometimes when you're reaching for the word it's like it's not there and you know um mm. i think it's just uh, the hesitation of like not wanting it i don't know how do i want to say this push almost sounds like it's a it's a grab like oh let's just reach for let's push for some diversity you know but really what it is is that um the field is open it's opening mm. and um and it's what people want and i think um honestly the <laughs> the stories that are coming from what we would call diverse voices are so rich and so considered mm -hmm. and i think a lot of the times um it you know it can be because um you know thinking of that dominant narrative type of idea or or like the you know we're we're talking about when we're talking about voices that have been historically marginalized we're talking about people who've had to put themselves in other people's shoes who've had you know and um often oftentimes at a detriment to themselves so there's a nuance to stories from people who've had that experience and um i I think it, I, I would say that, you know, for myself, who's been in this um, field for I, about the last five years, I think that seeing this expansion of horror and the richness of the stories that we're getting has been one of the things that has made this genre so good. Mm -hmm.